Okay, good day everyone. I think you have to put your headphones on because otherwise you're not going to hear me. Even though I will be quite loud, but still put the headphones on. Welcome to, I hope, one of the most interesting uh, panels of the IGF. And it concerns a very important topic. Remember Wikipedia, YouTube, Hulu, Netflix, um, government data, emails, all of these things that we are so used to. Does it work? No. I can hear you, but that's not. Yeah. Well, I can shout, but then there you have a problem. Channel 3. Should it be okay? Okay. Perfect. So all of these huge amounts of data that we use every day, channel 3, <laughs> uh, and we can wonder where are these data stored? How do we get to them? Sometimes we forget about that. Who cares about these amounts, piles of data? How are they transferred to the system? Who cares about their security, about the, the, our privacy? What are the policy challenges? What are the economic challenges? Even what are the environmental challenges? Just think about huge data centers which need to be powered, which need to be cooled down. There is quite a number of, of uh, challenges about that. And we are happy to have an excellent panel. I'll, I'll introduce one by one as we go. But as for setting the scene, I will call Ambassador David Gross to give a, a short introduction. What are we talking about? David. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And you all chose the right workshop to be at because this is clearly the issue not only of right now, but the issue of the next decade. Because what this panel is going to discuss d addresses virtually all of the major technical and public policy issues in the internet space. You're going to hear about the way in which technology is changing, both in terms of transmission and storage. You're going to be hearing about many of the challenges that come from those who try to provide these services on a transnational basis. The issues of privacy, the issues of security. But at its core, what we're really talking about is the next wave of innovation and the ability of people to get access to their data and the data of others in order to inform themselves to create more efficient and effective new businesses and jobs, the ability for them to educate themselves and others, and to continue to transform the world in ways that we cannot predict today, but will seem in a decade from now obvious. So how do we harness new technology? How do we allow for innovation? How do we balance access to information while at the same time securing that information from those who ought not to see it and to have access? These are tremendous technical challenges. These are tremendous policy challenges. And yet solving these problems and taking advantage of the opportunities is the key to the future and the global future of all of us. We have an extraordinary panel here. The reason I'm here is a combination of when you see the expertise that we have here on the panel together with the comments that we're going to be looking for from you all in your vision, your basis for understanding of what that future could look like and what, more importantly, are the enabling aspects to make the future the sort of future that you are comfortable with and perhaps, more importantly, your children and your grandchildren's comfortable with. So you're putting all those things together and having the expertise that we have up here. What we want to have is a dialogue. What we want to have is education. Not so much looking, in my view, for answers but rather to set the framework for the answers to find themselves as we go forward. And with that, I'm looking very much forward to hearing what this panel has to say and setting the stage. Thank you very much. And again, you've chosen well. Thank you, David. Um, even though you sit in the first row of the audience, you'll be on the panel. <laughs> but as 
will all of you, basically. And even though there is only one microphone, I love to run around the room, and I'll be gladly doing so. Whenever you have a question, and I'm sure we'll all have questions and examples, just raise your hand, and I'll run somewhere there to give you the microphone. But to start with, uh, let me just map, before map, mapping the field, map what we are going to do today. Firstly, we are going to try to explain how does it all work. What is the relation between the Internet Exchange Point and inter Internet infrastructure with data centers, with local data, with big data? How does it flow? How does it work? What are the trends in, with the clouds? And how, what are the amounts of data that are traveling through? Then we are going, going to hear a, a couple of examples from India, from Japan, and from Nigeria. How does it work setting up data centers? And what are the challenges? And at the end, we are going to discuss economic and policy aspects of big data. So to begin with, I would like to call on Bill Woodcock from Packet Clearing House. You've been a lot involved with, uh, with the infrastructure, with the internet exchange points, uh, data centers. How does it all, all work? I'm sure that not many of us are engineers here, and even those that are might miss this. How does it all work? OK, so um, I'm going to try and give the, uh, the sort of five to 10 minute overview here. Um, first of all, one needs to understand the distinction between content and eyeballs. Content and eyeballs are the shorthand used in the internet industry to describe traffic moving outward and traffic moving inward. Traffic moving inward is towards someone's eyeballs. They're looking at content. Content moves outward from a data center towards the user. So in uh, any internet transaction, traffic goes through an internet exchange point. Um, the traffic goes, so to, to, to look at what happens when you open a web browser. You open a web browser, you put in a URL, your web browser submits a query and gets a response. The query goes from your web browser through an internet exchange point to the web server. The web server receives the query, formulates an answer, sends that content back through an internet exchange point to the person who requested it, to your web browser. So that transaction is what forms the basis of the internet economy, right? Moving those packets is what makes money. It's what uh, allows people to see web pages. It's what allows advertisers to reach consumers, so forth. So the things to notice about that. Every packet goes through an internet exchange point somewhere. It goes through exactly one internet exchange point, never more than one exchange point. The packet that is the query going from the eyeball to the content is usually small, and it may go through one exchange point, whereas the response, the, the content, is usually relatively large by comparison, and it may go through a different exchange point. Often it goes through a different exchange point. So um, I can sort of use my hands to show what it looks like, right? You've got a user here, this hand, content, this hand. The user sends a query to an exchange point where it meets up with a long haul circuit going in towards the server. The server sends the response short to an exchange point where the user's ISP hauls it in back to the user. So we have something where the Outbound traffic always takes the shortest possible path. That's called hot potato routing, like the children's game where someone throws you the stone and you have to get rid of it again as quickly as possible, right? You're trying to uh, minimize what's called the bandwidth delay product. That is uh, the amount of bandwidth that's being used times the amount of time that it spends on your network, which results in cost to you, okay? So you're trying to minimize your cost by getting packets off of your network as quickly as possible. That's to the advantage of you, it's to the advantage of your customer, it's to the advantage of the person who's trying to serve the data. So short, short outbound paths to an exchange point, which results in a longer inbound path because that hasn't been optimized. But then the response, again, short outbound, long inbound. So that's the way all internet traffic moves. So. Looking at that bandwidth delay product, the important thing to remember is that speed times distance equals cost. The further you go, the faster you go, the more expensive it's going to be. The converse, the shorter the path 
or the slower you move, the less expensive it's going to be. You're always trying to maximize your performance and minimize your cost. So if you want to go fast and have a low cost, that means that you have to go as short a distance as possible. Okay? So where a user happens to be is not really governable, right? The user might happen to be here in this meeting room, or they might be in an office building in Tehran, or they might be driving their car down a freeway in Frankfurt, right? Any of those are possible. In aggregate, they're all actually happening, right? All of those cases are actually happening. So we have to be able to support all of them. We can't depend upon a user always being in the most convenient place. The user is where the user is. The content, on the other hand, can be replicated. The content doesn't need to be in a car on a freeway in Frankfurt. The content doesn't need to be sitting here in a meeting room, right? The content can be cloned. You can take it, you can put a copy of it on a server in Baku and then another server in Frankfurt and then another server in Tehran, right? The cost of replicating the content is very low compared with, say, the cost of cloning a human being, right? So the content gets replicated. The content gets cloned to servers in as many places as possible. Now, specifically, the places where you want the content is as close as possible to an internet exchange point. That means that the long haul in from wherever the user happens to be, that we can't govern, right? Because the user will be where the user is. But the short out from the content to the exchange point, that we can minimize. We can put the content in a data center that is in the same place as the, as the exchange point. We can put it in the same city. We can put it in the same building. We can put it in an adjacent building. In the big picture, we need to maximize opportunities for new market entry, right? We want new competitors always to be able to enter the market and provide services that are competitive with or more innovative than or at a lower cost than existing competitors. So we don't want a situation where only one provider of data center services, of hosting services, can provide, uh, can, can move content to an exchange point. So we don't want a situation where the exchange point and the content hosting service get tied together in a monopolistic uh, relationship. So exchange points tend to be neutral. They tend to be not aligned with any particular market uh, operator, right? Um, data centers, of course, are commercial businesses, right? So each one is its own business competing with other similar businesses. So the important thing here is that exchange points need to be located in places where several different uh, data center operators can be adjacent to it and connected directly to it. So the best places for exchange points are places where you can get space, buildings, unused office space, whatever, that is close to the exchange point and close to other spaces like that that can be turned into, you know, in the biggest case, a data center park. But in the, the more minimal case, maybe there's an exchange point in an office building and there's some free office space in that building that can have servers put into it. So basically that's, that's how this this stuff works from a sort of speed times distance equals cost perspective. Um, I think Bob is going to talk a little bit more about numbers. So, um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about uh, some of the data that uh, we've collected. Some of you may be familiar with our visual networking index study that looks at data traffic. We have a study now that in the second year, which is called our cloud index. Um, and there's really three, three parts to it. I'm going to sit down so actually I can see a screen. And you know, I can make more available the uh, available the, the more of the data later, but it looks at data center and cloud traffic, workload transition and cloud examples, and how people are using the cloud services, 
Um, and then we have actually have a cloud uh, readiness model and a cloud readiness, readiness, readiness index. So those of you who are familiar with our visual networking index study, it tracks global, national, regional uh, growth of data, fixed and mobile. But what we're also doing now is looking at data center traffic. And the tra this is the traffic um, both within data center, between data center, and to data centers and back. And this actually goes to the point Bill was talking about, about how do you uh, have efficient delivery and access and low cost, but highly efficient um, access to uh, data center traffic, cloud traffic, um, and what kinds of uh, network performance do you need to be able to achieve that? And what we're seeing is that data center traffic is growing globally now at a compounded annual growth rate of 31%, but it's huge amounts of data. This is, we're forecasting by 2016, over six and a half zettabytes. A zettabyte is 10 to the 21st. Um, to put it in perspective, by the way, across the global internet, if you took all of the global internet traffic from the beginning of the internet through this year, that would be 1.2 zettabytes of traffic combined. The entire history of the internet through the end of this year. So we're talking about dramatic, dramatic growths and data transmission. What's in my mind really interesting when I begin to look at these new data, what we're finding is that about 76%, let's call it three quarters of the data of the, the data center traffic stays within the data center. It's a lot of processing. There's also, and we'll, you know, I'm sure here later, about the scale efficiencies of data centers and why you, wanna, why you need large data centers or co-located data centers in order to be able to support this kind of you know, processing and traffic. Um, and then there's about 17% data center to, to, I'm sorry, data center to data centers less than 7%. And then let's call it 15 to 20% you know, 17% actually is accessing the data center by the end user. And that's, you know, web, email, you know, video, et cetera. We look at the different kinds of traditional data center applications and, and cloud applications. And here we're defining cloud as, share, as shared access to things like voice, video, data, processing, computing. So it's these on-demand types of services that are shared. Um, and over time, well, traditional data, if you go back even two or three years, there was very little cloud traffic. Today it's about, or last year it was about 40%. In four more years, it's gonna be two thirds of the traffic will be cloud-based. So these are access to data and processing and applications and services on demand that really didn't exist before. So this is taking things off of your desktop and putting them into the cloud dramatic, dramatic growth, and it's gonna be two-thirds of the traffic. In terms of the cloud traffic, as opposed to total data center traffic, here we're seeing an annual growth rate of compounded annually of 44%, and again, remember the data center by itself was at 31%. So this is gr the, the fastest growing part of the big data traffic flows from the data centers are the cloud applications. The other thing that's interesting is um, proportionally, the real growth is coming from consumer, not business. Whereas the early data center applications, again, this is common sense if you think about it, were large uh, enterprise government uses within their networks or within their organization. So it could be a large bank, it could be a large manufacturing firm, it could be computer-aided design, um, it could be government data center for access for the you know, processing of data, data records, healthcare records within the organization. But what we're seeing now are the, these cloud applications being driven largely by video and video on demand, right? That's really driving cloud and data center and therefore the traffic that is the consumer to data center and then also um, within and between data center. And I'm going through this very, very quickly personal content locker types of traffic, right? So these are, this is your content in the cloud. It's SkyDrive, it's iCloud, it's the Amazon Cloud Services, it's uh, you know Google Drive, et cetera, Dropbox. This is growing, it's more than doubling 
every year for the next, each year for the next five years. It's growing at over 100% globally, and we're forecasting that this kind of application, cloud traffic, will increase 42 times between 2011 and 2016. So what is cloud and how do we think about the applications? Nobody had done this last year, the first time we did it, was how do we think about cloud applications and what are the requirements for cloud applications? So we divided, you know, three baskets, basic, intermediate, and advanced. And we can get into the definitions of what is in each of these baskets, and it's all available online. But we looked at individual applications, and then we looked at what we call concurrent, multiple applications being run at the same time, because that's actually what's going on in the average household or office or school or hospital or government office. So for an individual application, a basic cloud application requires, it's not that much speed, right? I mean, it's, it's not really a bandwidth issue. It's about, um, you know, two and a half meg down and 750 kilobits up, and latency can be above 140, 160 milliseconds. An intermediate cloud application is, is going to, um, I'm sorry, this is a kilobit, so, you know, the, the download, upload. Um, so download uh, less than a megabit, three quarters of a megabit, upload uh, 250 kilobits. But for intermediate cloud applications, it re it's going to require more than that, up to two and a half meg per application downstream, upstream up maybe uh, even a megabit, and now your latency begins to become important. But when you're looking at advanced cloud applications, which also include some of the industrial applications, some of the medical applications, some of the shared work collaborative applications, then you're beginning to have additional requirements and latency of less than 100 milliseconds, which is tough. So that has to do with performance, getting the exchange points close. It's the distribution of the data center. And you're looking at not only uh, two and a half meg down and a meg up, but when you begin to then look at concurrent applications doing multiple things at the same time, whether it's at home where there are multiple people accessing the cloud for their personal applications or even work or school, but now it's certainly in the office or in the, uh, the school room where all of these things are residing in the cloud, even basic is going to require uh, almost two meg down 600 kilobits up, intermediate, seven meg down, two and a half megabits up, and for the advanced cloud applications, including real-time, you know, video, Skype video, or high-definition telepresence, and you begin to do these multiple times together, you're looking at a minimum requirement of 21 megabits down, nine megabits up, and again, less than 100 milliseconds. So these are the kinds of, of the network requirements to support the kinds of data applications in the cloud, these kinds of cloud applications that are being driven by the consumer. A lot of these, by the way, are going to be media and it's gonna be streaming video and it's going to be entertainment, but a lot of them also are gonna be the productivity enhancing applications and education applications and public purpose applications such as healthcare. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Um, well, maybe to follow up on a question, yep. I can come closer so that you can hear even without it. The question probably for you and Bill, but also the other panelists, uh, having the data that you showed here and knowing the bandwidths in developing countries, for instance, to what extent or what percentage of the cloud or the data storage is in developing countries and what would be in, in the Western world, so to say? So one of the things I didn't do because I wanted you, I was supposed to just give some basics. We've actually looked at a cloud readiness by region by, and by, by some of the countries. So we actually have data that look at that. And in terms of cloud readiness, um, there are some emerging uh, countries that actually have very good networks in place. They don't necessarily have the um, low latency or the high data rates to all the consumers yet, but they are, they've begun to deploy fiber, uh, especially in the metro areas or fiber in the backbone core so that they can be the location for data centers. But for the most part, in order to benefit from the productivity enhancing and social public purpose cloud applications, 
emerging economies are playing catch up in terms of the kinds of network requirements to be able to, for citizens and to, to access these applications and benefit from them, or even for the school to have access to the cloud application to be able to you know, provide the, the instructional material, or the healthcare, the clinic, again, uh, where, where a lot of these applications are going to be residing. So this is, so cloud is actually, and some of these new cloud applications, and for me, every time we do these studies, there are what I call an aha, there's something that surprised me. And when we did this for the first time last year, my big surprise, it was not bandwidth as the constraint, it was latency as the constraint. And this is really important. And on the, in the mobile world, what this means is that, and I had conversations, in fact, here this week um, with, with um, uh, regulators from some of the emerging economies, and I was, I was asking about, well, where are you on your 4G rollout? And they say, well, no, no, we're not going to do 4G now. We're migrating from 2G to 3G. And that makes sense until you realize if latency is important, the LTE, the 4G technologies have significantly lower latency because of the technical architecture and the way they're designed is flat IP, that you, they will enable, 4G will, will permit and enable advanced cloud applications or more advanced cloud applications that will not be possible over 3G. And if you recognize that the way most people in emerging economies are going to have access to broadband is over wireless networks, if they don't have the advanced wireless networks, they're not going to have access to cloud, advanced cloud applications. This is an ex extremely important point. And these are all new data. So these are, with some of these for me, the ahas. So I think Bob has just talked about what is. And I would like to answer in a different way, which is what must be. So I think that it's, it's always easy to look at developing countries and say, yes, well, they're behind in X, Y, and Z measures, right? And while that may be a true measurement of what is, um, if you look at what they have to do to partake of cloud services, you realize that they're not in any disadvantage. Nobody is at a disadvantage with cloud services because everybody has to do it locally because you cannot afford to move these kinds of bandwidth or th th this amount of bandwidth intercontinentally, right? It's, it's simply not cost effective. We don't have enough cable laying ships to make that possible, right? Likewise, even if you did, you'd never get the low latency because the speed of light is the speed of light. If you try and get low latency across a uh, 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 transatlantic cable or transpacific cable, it's just not going to happen. You're not going to move the bits faster. So you have to provide the services locally. And if you're providing services locally, nobody is at a disadvantage. Nobody has any particular, you know, corner on the market of doing stuff near themselves. Uh, so I would say that developing countries, th this is an opportunity for developing countries to catch up. This is an opportunity where companies providing cloud services will not be at a big advantage in serving the data from London or New York or Tokyo. They have to go out and serve it in Nairobi and, you know, wherever. They've got to do it locally to the consumer in order to be competitive. And I know we're going to talk more about this with the other panelists, and I agree with, I completely agree with Bill, although at the other extreme, we, you know, there are the advantages, the economies of scale and efficiency of large data centers. And so, you, you know, there's this balancing the tension. So we need to think about these as regional, you know, regionally located data centers. It doesn't, you're not going to have one data center, one place where you have to go across the oceans, but having clusters of local um, and regional data centers and then the internet exchange points Right, really are the enabler. Without them, it's not going to work. So these are sort of complementarities that are necessary uh, for this to happen. But I agree, but because of these needs that we're now really understanding, nobody today is behind because it's still new for everybody. But if you don't move quickly, you will be behind. So there are about 340 Internet exchange points in the world right now. So there's no point in replicating your data more than 340 times, right? Because you wouldn't get closer to anybody with the 341st replication. 
but up to 340 times, each replication is going to bring you closer to some set of customers. It's just that the smaller the exchange point, the smaller that set of customers. So how competitive a cloud-based service is, is going to depend very largely on how efficient their engineering is and how well they're able to provide services at small scales in small exchanges, because the better they can do that, the more of those 340 they can afford to hit, and the better overall quality of their service will be. Thank you. Uh, David, before, before we move to you, I just wanted to, uh, there is a question from remote, and anyone else wanting to ask anything technically or non-technically? While I read the remote, you can take a question. Uh, uh, you've talked about the uh, data centers, that they could be private data centers. But uh, what about the exchange points? Are there some private exchange points? And what are the, what are the models in how it could be? So there are some private exchange points. The vast majority of exchange points are uh, associations of the internet service providers and data center operators that use them. Um, private, private exchange points have one drawback and one advantage. The drawback is that they're not protected against acquisitions. They're not strictly neutral. Uh, the advantage is that they can lose money, right? They can entice a new participant in by, you know, uh, subsidizing their participation from some other source. Um, the data centers, there's not really any model for non-commercial data center. Um, but the, the main thing is just that the exchange point needs to be neutral so that as many data centers and ISPs as possible can participate in it without worrying about it being monopolized by a competitor. Uh, in Afghanistan, we have, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Omar. I'm sorry, I'm uh, from Afghanistan, the National ICT Alliance of Afghanistan. We have one data center, and that's uh, owned by the government. It's inside the Ministry of Communications, and it's hosting the government uh, data in their websites in all uh, e-government. Um, uh, they're talking about the exchange point, set a, setting up an exchange point for Afghanistan. Um, but it's still an idea. They haven't practically done anything. Um, but the governments all over the world, you would see they're very slow moving. And uh, I was wondering if, uh, if there is a, uh, we have a government data center model, and they've invested a lot on that. And uh, there is a, 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 a private sector. What would be the cost if, uh, for example, 10 to 20 ISPs come together and they want to set up a exchange point? So uh, typically the cost to set up an exchange point is between about $4,000 and about $40,000. The time involved is typically six to eight months of work uh, collaborating between the ISPs that are doing it to, in order to get everything set up. Um, the really astounding thing is that the um, so the exchange point, of course, once it's up and running, is generating bandwidth that is uh, augmenting and replacing bandwidth that otherwise would have had to come in through international circuits. So it has a value, right? What the bandwidth that it's creating, it's like a factory producing bandwidth that has value. So the time to return on the investment of building an internet exchange point is typically somewhere between a few hours and a few days. It's, rarely, it's rare that an exchange point takes as long as a week to pay itself off. So... Um, there's essentially no reason ever to not start an exchange point. They always benefit the community and the industry. Um, my name is uh, Ilyas Naibafai Lisli. I'm the director of Trans Eurasian Information Superhighway Project. We are trying to build a big pipeline basically from uh, Asia, Hong Kong to Frankfurt in Germany. And one argument I always used in support of the project is that the demand for the low latency and the cloud applications really requires us to have a tier one regional uh, network. Uh, what I hear from you today in, in the presentation is that it's possibly, it's, this is not such a strong argument. And what we really need instead of the big highways that run from uh, one region to another is more like a network of uh, local I ISPs. I, I just would like to ask your opinion 
how valuable could be a big kind of regional highway in a region where there aren't many. Like if you look at the global map of telecommunications, as I'm sure you all did a lot of the times, you see that there are very limited amount of tier one networks running in Eurasia. Most of them are in North America or in Western Europe. So from the point of view of latency and cloud services, do we really need those highways in the region? Yes, absolutely. But, and remember that there an important, yes, absolutely. The, but remember that a large portion of the uh, uh, data center traffic is data center to data center. So, and you do have the distributed cloud and the data center. So you're, you, you need the, 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 the tier one uh, high capacity fiber networks globally to every region off of which you then would build regional networks. Because if you don't have that in the first instance, you're not going to get the data center to data center traffic that you're going to want to pull things locally, right? Uh, and then from there do the local, the local distribution. So these are not mutually exclusive, but they, each part of these are mutually reinforcing, but you need both. And I'm, Bill, you yeah. may want to. So the way I usually explain this is that it's kind of like a loop and there are a bunch of stops on this loop. You need exchange points, you need local loop to reach end users, you need domestic backhaul, you need international transit, and or, or you know undersea fiber or whatever, ways of getting in and out of the country, and you need a regulatory environment that makes all of this work properly, okay? So those five things. It's like a loop. At any given time, there's a bottleneck, and you need to address that bottleneck. You address that bottleneck, fix that thing, that reveals the next bottleneck, right? Maybe you take care of the exchange points, you get them built, and suddenly you realize you need a, not, a lot more international bandwidth. You get that taken care of, and suddenly the bottleneck is now on the local loop into people's houses. So you do a new domestic fiber deployment. Now the local loop is in your regulatory agency because you find out that there aren't enough people who can build fiber out in the country, right? So you address these things, you keep going around and around, right? 110% annual growth, more than doubling in size every year for 30 years. You have to just keep going around that circle, working your butt off constantly for an entire career, right, to keep up. Um, so the answer to your question is absolutely you need that, and you also need the local loop and the regulatory environment and so forth, right? You need all of these pieces, and the moment you think you've gotten through with those five pieces, Start over. you're starting over. Now, I see Naven is knocking the head, and uh, you're, you're confirming that these are the things that are really needed for, for the developing country. Now, there we have a couple of cases from India, from uh, Japan, and from Nigeria, and we have AT&T, and we have Google, and we have a local data uh, center. What are the experiences is in, in, in your countries? Navin. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, agree uh, to my fellow participants in terms of, uh, yes, we need to have all the five points together, and more importantly, the regulatory framework and the policy framework. Especially from an Indian context, yes, cloud is new from a telecom service pr perspective. But the good thing is uh, there have been discussions uh, going on, uh, especially recognition of uh, cloud as an important uh, uh, road, future roadmap in the national telecom policy, as well as uh, the regulator them himself have come out with consultation and discussion with the industry to understand the fine pieces and nuances involved. Uh, somehow, but uh, we ha need to understand, especially when we talk about localization of data and its implications, there are a couple of issues. Uh, yes, there is a need to have uh, a sovereign uh, need to protect its, uh, the data in country. There are a couple of issues relating to the privacy of your data, the security of the data, need to have enactments and judicial framework relating to data protection. So as a global operator in India, we have been uh, working with the government and uh, again, there have been some draft consultations uh, which schemes to address the issues on privacy and encryption uh, because uh, as we move along, gone are the days when we used to have only in-country networks. The future is cloud. And in a global environment, it becomes imperative that there should be a free flow of information and data across networks. Agreed, uh, subject to your local regulatory norms. But unless we have uh, interoperable compatibility and mutual recognition of our standards and certification, 
this will seem difficult. So uh, we should certainly uh, continue. If the economy has to grow, the global environment has to grow, it is very important that we certainly fix these pieces relating to the privacy, data protection, and settle the jurisdiction issue of cross-border data flow. Uh, in India, the remarkable uh, work is currently on, and it started uh, way back in 2006 when the government of India enhanced the foreign direct investment limit in telecom sector from 49 to 74%. But with that came a couple of uh, uh, security-related concerns, uh, which, which stated that you can't uh, take your uh, data, especially customer data, billing data, outside of country. But with that, uh, the discussions going on and, and, and recognition of the fact in the policy that we need to make, make India as one of the global hubs in cloud. So effort is already underway. And, and as, as a company, as an industry association which we head, we have been working continuously on developing and, and coming out with rules which, are, uh, which favor uh, the cross-border data flow and with that not restricts or impede the growth of global networks just by localizing into a particular country. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more point from India. Naresh. My name is Naresh Ajwani. Um, I was a director with National Internet Exchange of India, so my uh, response would be more on the experience of National Internet Exchange in India. Uh, Despite we have a seven internet exchange points, the traffic is only at two exchange points. And I have a question to Bill and a compulsive argument I'm looking forward in terms of how to convince ISPs from or desist them from doing a private peering. They prefer private peering, uh, which is one of the reason of not getting this internet exchange points the traffic data which we, we expect, at least in a country like India? Well, um, I would encourage you to compare the practices at Nixie with the practices at exchange points that you feel are more successful. I think Nixie has unfortunately had a, a series of policies that have discouraged participation. I think that um, price is a big one. And I think that keeping up with technology is a big one. Uh, I think that there has been a lot of confusion in the policies at Nixie that have made it unclear to what degree they are neutral. Um, in this case, the neutrality is not so much, it's not that anybody is afraid that Nixie is going to get bought by their competitor. It's that people are not clear whether Nixie is competing with them. And I think that's gotten better over time. But, and I think if, if one took a fresh view right now, one would find that maybe the problem is not so bad as it is in many people's minds, right? But the problem is that we have now almost 10 years of a, a, a poor relationship between Nixie and the community that Nixie desires to serve. And it's not clear to me from my conversations with ISPs in India how likely that is to be fixed. And that's why I see ISPs in India doing so much private peering in data centers that are not otherwise exchange points. And um, it's, it's very much hampering growth in India. Um, uh, we did some analysis for Reliance Industries a year ago that <coughs> indicated that you needed not only, in order for them to do the national broadband rollout that they wanted to do, not only were 10 times as many internet exchange points needed, each exchange point needed to be almost 100 times as large as the seven that exist. So they needed 70, 70 rather than seven, and they each needed to be about 100 times larger. Bill, Naresh again. I just clarified that those policies you are referring to, X minus Y, et cetera, and all, have been abolished. Still, there is a challenge of a private peering being preferred more visa to internet exchange point. Yeah, I know. Like I say, I think that the actual situation is better than people's perception of the situation, and that people's perception has been built up over a long time when 
they were living with those policies that weren't working, right? So it may be that Nixie can salvage that relationship, and it may be that people will not give Nixie the chance to salvage the relationship. I don't know. I, there's nothing I can do one way or the other. I, I'm just an observer. I, I wish to explore also the African perspective there. And Jimson, you're, you're working with a local data center. Now, why did you, how did you come encouraged to go into that, having the previous discussions? And what is the state of, state of art in Africa when it comes to Nigeria, when it comes to IXPs and data centers? Thank you very much. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I leave my business on the internet and I have a lot to do with data. Uh, but uh, not necessarily that uh, uh, I'm managing a data center. I consult to building data center, so I'm, very, I'm an industry leader, so I know a lot, uh, quite a lot about it. Well, my name again is Jimson Olufuye. I used to be the, the president of the Information Technology Industry Association of Nigeria. Uh, I finished my term last year, and uh, after that uh, uh, responsibility, I saw a, a need uh, in Africa at large for us to have uh, an organization where we can speak with one voice. And uh, there in May, um, uh, my colleagues in African countries, we came together in the ICT Industry uh, Association to form the Africa ICT Alliance. And uh, through this network, uh, the idea is that from the private sector, we'll be able to share information, share ideas on how to uh, uh, cheetah povot, African development in terms of ICT. Uh, when I say cheetah povot, it's beyond uh, catching up. It's beyond uh, leapfrogging. Uh, you know, cheetah is the fastest animal and uh, povot. And so we need to really move fast. And uh, this message uh, was really shared in the Nigerian industry uh, about uh, four, three, four years ago. And... Uh, before then, uh, internet penetration was very poor. Uh, telephone te density very uh, poor too. In fact, uh, if you look back uh, ten, uh, ten years uh, before now, uh, the tele density in Nigeria used to be 0.05 percent, but now ten years later, we're looking at uh, about 65 percent uh, tele density, and internet uh, access about 30 uh, percent. That used to be 0.01 percent about ten years ago. And uh, the advent of uh, Internet Exchange Point ex helped a great deal. Uh, right now, we, we have uh, about six, we are building this, uh, the, the sixth uh, uh, exchange point, six exchange point in the critical region in Nigeria. Uh, the role of regulator is very key. I allude to those five points, key, you know, to uh, localizing data. Uh, the regulator, uh, actually did a lot of uh, facilitation. Uh, number one, uh, the, there was a relationship with the operators, and there was also a relationship with the user. So there was what we call user parliament. In fact, it happens every, every month, user parliament. They just finished one. So the regulator is uh, really industry friendly, and uh, that helped a great deal. We, uh, even as I'm speaking, we're working on having another uh, copy of, uh, say, L Root in Nigeria. Uh, that the, the first copy came in last year, and uh, these are the things that could speed up data. In the entire African region, uh, I think we have about uh, uh, eight countries that have uh, root server copies. That is very important. And uh, Exchange Point, 17 countries in, in Africa have IXP uh, uh, Exchange Points. And uh, right now, we have a lot of undersea cables. Uh, the ice, indeed, uh, big uh, pipe is very important. You know, transregional pipe is very important. In fact, uh, we, until we had big uh, data uh, conduit between Europe and Nigeria, uh, broadband, there was nothing like broadband. But now we're talking about broadband. In fact, local data is increasing. My local language is Yoruba. So there are a lot of Yoruba materials, Yoruba contents, you know, all of a sudden. And that uh, leads to the proliferation of data centers. You have the telco building their own data centers and uh, government data center. In fact, they're expanding the government data center. Government is talking about uh, paperless office. Okay, so even with the, with the challenge of security, 
challenge of priority, but because of the, the platform, you know, the latency is reduced. The latency is reduced and the cost is also reduced. So there is an interest in uh, getting this across. So I want to underline the, the role of regulators. Those regulators are here, uh, representative, very important. The, uh, perhaps Nigerian uh, style could be uh, used or could, could be adopted relating with the, with, the, with the users, with the user parliament. Every month is in the seventh year. They get feedback all the time. They are criticized and also with the operators. And uh, even the law is trying to catch up. The law they, they, is like, you know, the, the parliament trying to get the law, the debates, and so on and so forth, then a time will expire. So getting the law to catch up is a challenge, but the practicality, people need this. People need the services, and it needs to be at real speed of light, and uh, it must be on demand. So uh, we are truly on the, on the path to uh, cheat up over voting. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, when we talk about uh, the big ones that are uh, using the data centers, that we have Google, and okay, the Japanese experience is probably much different, or is it, from the African and Indian perspective? Uh, so hi, I'm uh, Ko Fuji from Google, and I'm from Japan. Um, so uh, yes, uh, um, I think it is right to say that Google is not a uh, Japan-specific product or, or a service. Um, it is a uh, Google is a cloud-based internet company. Um, so um, I'm afraid my uh, my uh, experience on um, uh, intervention will not be uh, specific to Japan, but I hope I can uh, paint a uh, holistic view of how Google. Uh, sees uh, data centers and, and uh, what are the uh, factors that, uh, that come into play in building data centers. So uh, I guess the topic that I was asked to speak on was uh, where do we build data centers and why are they there? So uh, try to speak from that perspective. And uh, as I said, Google is a uh, cloud-based internet service. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Robert for bringing up uh, the difference between consumer-based cloud services and, uh, and, uh, and corporate-based uh, cloud services. So Google is uh, both. Uh, we do provide uh, Google Apps, which is an uh, enterprise, uh, enterprise go go uh, cloud service for uh, corporations as well as governments and organizations. And all of the services that consumers use, such as Gmail and YouTube and Search and Maps, um, all these are all web service, um, uh, web cloud services. Um, cloud means that uh, shared access, um, as I think Robert has said, uh, and it means that you are, are free from uh, the device that you use, whether it be PC or handset or, or, or tablet. Um, and, it, uh, and what it gives you is it gives you the, um, the flexibility um, to use uh, your content from wherever you want, whenever you want. And it also, if you're a corporation, it also gives you the reliability and the scalability. So um, um, in, in that regard, I'd like to talk about um, how we uh, build data centers. There are actually um, various um, factors that come into play when we talk about building data centers. And I, I think throughout this discussion, um, the, the first two discussions have uh, focused on, uh, on network engineering aspects, and we've also had uh, discussions about um, privacy and other security-related regulations. Um, those two are very important aspects, but there are other factors that come into play, and so as such, I, can, I hope that I can uh, paint a more holistic view about um, building data centers. So um, we have a rigorous, we as, as in Google, have a rigorous uh, process in place around selecting sites for our data centers, um, we, and we take into many technical and other considerations into account. Um, some of the key things that we look into are, of course, what we have already discussed. One is our pr proximity to our users. Um, we like to be close to our uh, large users, and uh, you know we, we like to serve uh, as many people as we can. So proximity is is a key, and uh, reliable network and bandwidth uh, to uh, serve the volume and prevent lat latency is is also important. I think we've discussed this. And uh, reasonable business regulations is also important. 
um, and um, privacy regulations, um, as, as uh, Naveen has, I think, discussed. But not only that, but um, political stability of a given country um, and whether that country maintains a reasonable uh, or a rule of law. And content regulations can also uh, come into play. Um, we like to make sure that uh, how a host country monitors and censors internet traffic uh, and what they can require of providers like Google in that regard. That is also important. Um, outside from these regulatory um, aspects, um, Google uh, data centers is a uh, they consume a lot of energy and uh, and as as a corporate uh, entity uh, we care a responsible corporate entity we care ab a lot about um, energy efficiency and its impact on the environment so uh, the existence of reliable power reliable uh, renewable energy um, to the extent that we can um, and the provision of power is also um, a, a very important factor um, other physical uh, locations um, and uh, climate is also important um, because the, uh, the data centers produce a lot of heat. Um, other factors um, such as cost. Cost is important. Cost as in, you know, could be tax or, or other um, contingency costs that could happen in building data centers in the locations where you um, would try to uh, locate them. And also um, people build and people operate data centers. So um, I think one of the important things is that availability of skilled workers, um, that is also important. Um, so all these things come into play and it's not, um, ideally we like to serve, uh, um, you know, there, there are 340 exchange points and customers and users all over the world. Um, but uh, given these factors, there are uh, certainly um, choices and uh, decisions that we have to make and uh, where we locate the data centers. So. Um, and, but where are these data centers located? Um, and a lot of people ask these questions. Um, and we do realize that a lot of people are uncomfortable about um, handing over their, their uh, data to an unknown location. So we uh, strive to be transparent. Um, I, th uh, I think that transparency is key to trust. And trust is key to uh, uh, a healthy development of cloud services. So we did put up a website um, that shows you uh, the pictures of inside and outside of our da data centers and also provides some locations of data centers. Um, you can actually go to uh, google.com uh, slash about slash data centers. Um, you can see a lot of uh, neat pictures and um, more detailed explanations about the security measures that we place in, in these data centers. Um, for your information, the, uh, the data centers that are up on the web and you can see them are, are lo currently located in United States, Finland, Belgium, Ireland, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore. So uh, that is all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned a very important part, and uh, that is costs and the economic part of uh, setting up and uh, maintaining the, the, the data centers and then all the other economic perspectives. Sam, I, I know that you have quite a good overview of, of the economic aspects. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Sam Paltridge. Could you bring my presentation up on the screen? Um, just while the presentation's coming up, um, I was asked to provide an economic perspective, and the ec economics being the dismal uh, science, I'm here to be dismal um, and talk about costs. And what I was asked to talk about are basically the costs of um, legal or regulatory barriers uh, to transborder data flows. I could actually do it in one um, slide. Now, there's, there's very good reasons to have regulation in areas such as privacy, and we've just heard about that. But essentially, markets need information uh, to operate efficiently. And if you put barriers on that flow of information, you essentially impede economic and social development. And the internet basically regards this as an inefficiency and roots around it. And if the internet roots around it, you also lose the benefits that come with the internet. And, you know, that's basically, you know, if I only had one minute for a presentation, what I'd say. But since Vlad's given me um, about eight minutes, 
I'm going to extrapolate a bit and give an example. And because cloud computing is, is very new, um, there aren't a lot of examples of, uh, ha well, there aren't a lot of examples that allow me to be dismal. And I needed an example for me to be dismal and talk about how bad, re bad regulation could impose costs on transborder data flows. So what I chose is because I know telecoms pretty well is termination charges. And if you don't know, there's a number of countries around the world that are imposing termination charges on incoming international traffic. Now you can say, well, everyone does that. Everyone charges termination. But what these countries and what makes them different is the governments are imposing a standard rate for termination across all providers. So here in the slide I've given the example of, of Ghana, which imposes 19 cents as a standard termination charge across all operators, whether they be fixed or mobile. Six cents, that's the blue charge in the slide, goes to the government. Well, perhaps because they pay a company to monitor the traffic and probably half that goes th to that company. Um, the reddish part is the amount of money that goes um, to the operators and the green part is the amount that Skype adds to that charge and then there's an extra charge on that which is the purple part of the slide and that's the tax that at the other end of the call um, a government will charge in value added tax. So say this is a call from the UK or the US to Ghana using Skype, there you get, to, there you get up to about 32, 33 cents, which includes tax on tax. So it's consumers paying tax on tax. If you look at a, a call, a Skype call in the opposite direction, it's about two and a half cents. I could have chosen any of the Ghanan mobile operators or perhaps Airtel, and they charge about the same price for an international call from Ghana to the US. So you can see there's a st substantial difference and when you start having substantial differences like this, you start to get all sorts of bypass happening, you start to get all sorts of effects that the government may not anticipate when they impose that regulation. And so I'll stop picking on Ghana and I'll shift to, to Congo to give an example of what happens when you apply a policy like this to incoming international traffic for termination. Now looking at this, the two slides, they show the number of telephone calls that go from the US to Congo and the number of minutes that go from the US to Congo. Can anyone guess at the, at the point in time when the tax was applied? Increase the cost to consumers, consumers react. They make less calls. There's less traffic, the government gets less revenue, there's an overall welfare loss to consumers, everyone loses. This is what happens when you get bad policies about the international transfer of data. Now you can say, Sam, that occurred about the time of the international financial crisis. So was it the international financial crisis that caused that drop? Probably that contributed. But what I've done in this slide is show the average for Africa, which is the blue chart, with three countries that introduced standard termination fees on incoming international traffic. The red one is our friends in the Congo. That's had this policy for the longest, that's a year and a half. You can see the biggest drop of traffic has occurred with the greatest amount of time, that's for the Congo. The other two have only had the policy for the years that data are available for six months. And you can see lesser drops, but again, you can see a substantial drop above the average for Africa. So if governments don't think through these policies that they apply to international data transfer, this is what can happen. Now, I'll stop picking on Africa and I'll go to Pakistan. Pakistan is about to introduce, or has just introduced, this policy. It's set up what it calls uh, an international clearinghouse. Basically what it is, it's a cartel. And it's not often you, ha you can show a photo of the cartel members. But these are all the members of the international uh, companies that provide international services into Pakistan. And what the government has done is said, okay, we're going to make a standard termination charge that all operators must apply, and we're going to lock in market shares. This is, this is exceptional. 
Imagine if you're a telephone company in this room and you're allowed to lock in your market share. It doesn't matter how good the competition is, how good the new innovative services in, you can have your market share forever. And of course, it doesn't make sense. And the, 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 the lady in this picture is the head of the competition commission. She said it doesn't make sense. But the policy has still been introduced and it's been there for a month now. So last week, some of the people that want to challenge this policy took it to the High Court and the High Court said, well, perhaps this doesn't make sense, we need to have a look at this, and they've currently put it uh, on hold while they consider it further. So what's the real cost of this? One is an economic cost. And if any of you have got time, you can read, read the slide, read the text. There's lots of diaspora overseas. They send lots of money home to developing countries. They don't earn a lot, and what I, I put, picked... <laughs> I pulled this story off um, one of the news stories today because there's the diaspora all around the world objecting to um, Pakistan's new policy. And basically, this is from Oman, and it's two gentlemen that were interviewed in the paper today, basically saying, we don't earn a lot. We spend a lot of it calling home. Some of us don't visit home for, for three or four years. We like to talk to our families either daily or weekly. If you, if you triple the cost... This bite, this is a large bite out of our income. And here you see uh, two examples. So there's a social cost as well as an economic cost that hasn't been thought through. So, in summary, yes, you need regulation. Yes, you need regulation for all sorts of reasons. You need it for privacy, etc. But if you're thinking about cloud regulation, think about the costs and think about what bad regulation can do. In this example, um, less competition, more bypass, less traffic, um, higher costs for consumers, uh, business, diaspora, and then taxes. I mean, the reason that governments think that they can do this is because they think they're going to get higher taxes. But as you can see, the traffic drops, so you're taxing a lower base. So you, you, <laughs> your tax revenue goes down, and you're double taxing. So you're taxing the tax. It doesn't make sense. And this is bad for your economic and social development. Was that dismal enough? <laughs> well, definitely. <laughs> I don't know if anyone of, uh, of the Ghana, Pakistani, or uh, what was the third one? Congo people are here, if they want to respond. <laughs> but <laughs> but, uh, but uh, along the same, the same line uh, of, of the experiences, and then... We've heard a little bit from Google. And Jackie, uh, Verizon is, is one of the biggest companies in this field and all over the world. Now, after listening to all these examples and how the things are happening in the developing world, how, would you say, how are you managing as, as, a, as a Verizon in, in, in this field in developing countries and in the in U.S.? Well, first of all, I'm not an economist. So I'm not going to have the, uh, the, the truly dismal analysis here. Uh, I'm, I'm with a company that actually has a, a lot of experience in offering global services. And so one of the points that I want to make is that as we move into cloud services, they are different in many ways, but they're the same in many ways. And I think there are implications for that as you look at, at public policy. They're, they're different because they offer enormous benefits, particularly as we move forward with them, that at a scale of a nature that has not been possible before. So I will first summarize some of the benefits that are, are already happening or are potential for emerging economies because it's the, it's the loss of that potential opportunity that uh, creates the harm if we get policy wrong. There's a, a paper that recently came out, and I should figure out a way to get the link up somewhere, uh, by uh, several economists, Peter Cowie and Michael Kleeman, on the uh, implications of cloud for emerging economies. And, and these were some of the things that they identified as the benefits that could be at risk. So as, as all services become more ICT intensive, to be able to have ICT intensive services in your own economy 
enables competition in that space. Second, there's a lot of south to south commerce that is growing. It's a really a big growth area. And this is a way to be uh, well positioned there. Third, they found, and they did case studies in three economies, that cloud services can particularly strengthen small and medium, medium enterprises that otherwise would not be able to have the full uh, extent of functions that you can get if you're tapping into cloud services. Fourth, significant benefits for individual and government users. They actually found there are a lot of governments that are particularly looking to do E-type services that are based on cloud. And finally, that there are a lot of strong synergies between using cloud services and building out broadband infrastructure. They each need each other, and so it causes kind of mutual reinforcement and growth. The problem is that there are all these possible benefits, but there also are policies in some places that really create barriers to the cross-border data flows that are, that are inherent. You can have some localized cloud services, but you cannot really have the full potential unless they're cross-border and they're global in nature. So even to benefit your domestic in-country ICT, you really need to be able to tap into the global. And the kinds of things that are causing concerns as they come up or are considered are requirements for localization. Uh, that are mandatory government requirements to locate or manage data in country. And if that's done in 180 countries, then you really don't have global services or even, even a number of countries. There are also mandates on technology, which to use, or uh, mandates on uh, encryption is a, is a good idea. In a number of places, there are uh, limits on the sophistication or complexity of encryption that one can use, which then means you can't have the degree of security that might be beneficial for these and other services. There are also, in some places, restrictions or proposals to restrict the number of international gateways so that all the traffic comes through one or a limited number of them. And, and I must say there are some proposals along those lines that have come through the ITU looking for global regulations there. Um, government monitoring or controlling of cross-border data can be another barrier. And finally, there's a question of interoperability and portability. You hear this a lot in discussions of cloud. You want them to be interoperable. You want customers to be able to take their data elsewhere if they want to change providers. These are all good things, but the question is, is it, is it a government mandate or is it something that industry develops on its own in a more nimble way? So the point I'm trying to make is that these could be challenges to what otherwise brings economic benefit. So then my final thing here is to say, well, how would we think about public policy? Because I, I do public policy. I'm not an economist. But how, uh, as a government official and as private sector that's involved and as users, how would you think about this? And here are a few thoughts. One, if, if, if a country wants to have a cloud policy, and perhaps others might comment on it because they're seeing this in where they are, I think one of the questions, you do issue spotting, but one of the questions then is, are some of these issues, are many of them already covered either by our policy or by, by good practices in the marketplace? And that's why I was saying, we've been doing global services for large enterprise customers, cross-border services for years. We, we've managed to different privacy regimes in different countries, managed to comply with all of them. And so ask, well, do we need to impose a new rule, or is a lot of this already covered? Secondly, uh, could it be covered through self-regulatory codes of conduct? perhaps even with what we call, we call here in this place, uh, of all places, multi-stakeholder input, government, consumers, users, and industry. Third, how much can we benefit from, how far can we get through relying on consumer education and, co and consumer protection regimes? Because I think many of the concerns around cloud services can be addressed or mitigated through consumers understanding as best possible what the privacy options are, how to really kind of work with the system and the protections that are already there. 
Uh, fourth, I did have the, uh, the point about making the distinctions between uh, consumer-based services and enterprise services where uh, certain issues in the latter case are done by contract and negotiation. If you look, after looking at all of those things, there will remain some issues that are truly complex, and I'll just uh, list two that I do think are important uh, for a lot of uh, consideration and policy discussion, and one is, as has been mentioned, how to manage the privacy considerations. I don't, I don't say balance them or that they're inconsistent. I say how did we, was it, one achieve both the goals of privacy and the goals of security and figure out how to manage that. And then finally, last point here, I do think that there are, in the legal area, some unique extraterritorial jurisdictional questions that do come up as these services evolve, and that that's important to look at. Uh, often, it, it's, oftentimes, those questions are not ones that you would necessarily think we have to resolve before going further, but they may be issues that can be uh, put in a place for serious consideration as services continue to, uh, to evolve and roll out. So those are, those are my thoughts on this final question of the, the policy related to what everybody's been describing. Thank you, and you basically responded to a question from a remote participant which was exactly about what would be the policy suggestions. So I think you gave a, an excellent outline of that. We don't have much more time, and I thought of finishing the panel with a couple of comments from the audience. Now, I know that we have here and here and there. Be quick. And uh, Faisal Hassan from ISOC Bangladesh. I heard uh, Robert Paper saying that latency is the problem in developing countries, but isn't it a problem in uh, all over the world uh, with the issue of buffer blot? Uh, so how to solve this problem? Thank you. Uh, on yeah, one comment on the list of policies that you suggested. The way we have been talking to cloud is, well, especially when you talk about policies, is is really defensive. You know, privacy, security, extraterritorial, you know, um, rules, etc. I'm, I'm never hearing what sort of policies that we need to, to put in place in order to enable growth, to, to enable growth, more jobs more companies, more startups, and I think that's where we need to focus as well, and where governments need to put a lot of energy thinking about how to, how to take cloud to the next step rather than how to stop from, for, if it from growing. My name is Fiona Songa. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Telecommunication Service Providers Association that runs the Kenya Internet Exchange Point, and uh, Based on the discussion we've had uh, this afternoon from the panelists, mine is uh, two points. One, I think what comes out clearly is the fact that it is not possible to work on uh, localization of data without considering the, s the status of the exchange point, the level of content and where the content sits in terms of trying to localize that content, and the availability of data centers and I think with data centers, I would emphasize on neutral data centers because we do have a situation in Kenya where there are data centers, but because the data centers are owned either by government or private sector operators, we don't exactly have firms in Kenya that uh, specialize in building, ju just building data centers and running data centers. So that creates a challenge in terms of being able to, to synchronize all the three in order to be able to effectively bring out the economic benefit of localized data to the end users and the economy as a whole. And I think that is something that we sh should not be overlooked and should be emphasized on. Secondly, based on our experience, we've realized, we realized that and we have gone out of our way as operators to seek neutral data center operators to come into the country and we've used uh, different uh, forums and partners for these and it's bearing fruit to a point that in the next uh, couple of months there, there's likely going to be an Equinix run data center within Kenya which uh, uh, is going to be a neutral data center because Equinix are not in the business of the telcos. They really pretty much specialize in putting up data centers. Thanks. Thank you. We have one more comment in the back and then we wrap up. Yeah. My name is Bitange and 
I just want to get a clear position. I'm not answering Fiona's question, but Robert said there is an issue with latency when the data centers are offshore. And Jackie said that you need to leverage on data centers that are uh, offshore so that you can get the economies of, um, of scale. So can the contradiction be cleared? Okay, we have two more. <coughs> Gaurav Upadhyay from uh, Limelight Networks. Um, actually, I'd add to that. I think I was sharing what Robert said and what Bill said and what Sam said. And a lot of times these days the compromise is, you know, whether you, you build a local data center and build to that place or given the use of DWDM and all the other technologies, the transit cost, the transport cost is going down so much. At the same time, the cost of building the capex in building a new data center and running it is so high that unless there is strong economic business there, you know, we, we don't see a prospect of building into new markets. I mean, ourselves, and I've, I've had this discussion with a lot of people, is once the fiber is there, DWDM makes it really cheap to backhaul stuff to an existing center. So the economic is skewing towards using offshore existing centers rather than having the capex to develop new centers. I don't know if Sam has done any work on that or how do you see that? And that's where the latency is always going to be a compromise, you know. Thank you. One last, one last comment. I have to finish here. Uh, Hisham. Uh, thank you, Vlada. Uh, I, I, I got several messages from, from the panel on uh, how this cloud uh, trend is not uh, uh, putting developing countries uh, at a disadvantage. And uh, from, from what I see of policy challenges and other technical issues, I think there is a challenge for developing countries. It's not that the cloud is a bad thing, but it, it is challenging. And everyone needs to, to, to take good account of that. Uh, for me, I think uh, one principal change is uh, it presented in the, in the intervention or the, uh, the uh, presentation from Google. Uh, now the, the data centers, they set the criteria for the place to be, to be put. Usually in traditional services, governments would set a certain criteria for services to be delivered in their countries. Now it's, it's the other way around. Now the, the big data centers, they, they put the criteria for which place to, to put the, the data centers. So this is challenging in terms of policy in addition to the other things. Uh, it also puts uh, more load on the, uh, on the traffic uh, and the international segment of that. So uh, I'm not again saying that cloud is a bad thing. Uh, it is serving customers, especially with the proliferation of devices that each user is using nowadays. But uh, again, it, it should be recognized as a challenge for developing countries especially. Thank you, Hisham. Um, whoever wants of you, Twitter form, 140 characters, quickly. You want to start, uh, Robert, or Bill? So I would say that um, what Sam said uh, in his relatively diplomatic way uh, can, can answer what you're saying, that the problems that you observe in developing countries are occasionally they're due to geography, occasionally they're due to economics, but very often they're due to sort of self-inflicted policy problems, right? And by opening up the policy environment, by opening up the regulatory environment, by making it look more like the regulatory environment in places that are working well that you want to emulate, that's how you get businesses to, instead of saying, well, we'll locate in Singapore and backhaul to you, instead that we'll build a data center here because it's a place that's good for business. A number of people have asked the same question about, well, what about the latency versus the scale economies? And again, it's the balance. It's not mutually exclusive. And when you do have the new DWDM uh, high-speed networks, right, you can be hundreds of miles. I mean, local is relative. 15,000 miles is not the same as 1,000 miles or 500 miles. So this is really, you know, again, thinking of this, there, can, there are the data center to data center, the, the efficiencies Jackie talked about. Um, but then there are the regional data centers, you, you know, for continents. Uh, 
the other issue I think that Jackie was addressing is, which you know, Bill is also talking about, is there's, you make the decisions to place the data centers on the architecture, on the technical requirements and the business model. The concern is that there could be ba legal barriers to the efficiencies that would require data centers to be so localized that you lose any all of the efficiencies, right? That's the other extreme, right? And that is the potential downside, one of the potential extreme costs and unintended consequences of policies geared to requiring that every country have its own data centers and they will not allow transborder data flow, right? The market can't support them. You don't need it for the latency. You don't need it. In fact, it, it violates the rules of efficiency. So it's getting the balance right and making the decisions based upon the architecture, the technology, and the business case, not based upon regulation. Um, so tw tweet, two tweet answers to the two questions. One from the gentleman there about jobs and big data. That's on our work program. We'll be looking at that. And the question back there on backhaul and fibre, yeah, we're going to be looking at that too. Yeah. So, uh, the, and I like that question on policy. Uh, the objective uh, behind uh, suggesting some policy measures relating to cloud is not to say that we want regulation on cloud. The suggestion is to have the elements which might have effect on the growth of cloud. So, one of the requirements of having a privacy registration so, because there is a legitimate need to protect the privacy of customers and the data. Secondly, there's a legitimate need also of the meeting the requirements of lawful enforcement agencies of respective countries. That's very important. So, when we say put in place the policy, it means to create an environment which fosters cloud because you have endless opportunities. But at the same time, there are legitimate requirements of having uh, data servers within the country for getting the required information for protecting the domestic turf. Having said that, security, location of a particular server has got nothing to do with security. You might be having in-country servers and data servers, but that doesn't mean that you are, your turfs are protected. So what we need to have is proper privacy legislations, ensuring security of the data by way of having proper encryption rules, which allows uh, uh, safety of the network and have data protection rules so that not only your country is protected, but your customers' interests also protected. Thank you so much. Cool. Tweet. Uh, yes, I will be very quick and uh, try to answer the, uh, the question from the gentleman back there um, about uh, big companies setting criteria for uh, places of data centers. Um, so I'd like to apologize if my uh, statement uh, was a, a bit misleading. The whole point that I wanted to make was that it should not matter um, where the data centers are located, especially for these um, big data centers that provide uh, advanced cloud services um, and content locker services. Um, theoretically, yes, from a net networking engineering uh, perspective, you'd want to be close to your, um, y your, uh, your users. But if you want to put the content uh, close to, the, the, uh, to your users um, to avoid latency, um, you do not necessarily have to have these full-fledged um, data center, big data centers inside your country. And the, the other risk is that the risk that, that Robert has pointed out is, is a fragmentation. Uh, you don't want to have data centers in, in every country um, only for the, to, to serve your own country. Um, the, the redundancy um, is actually the strength of data centers. So you would want to have them in many parts of the world, but not necessarily one for each country to serve the citizen of that country solely. Uh, really, I think the idea of uh, the localization of uh, data uh, is very relevant to Africa as a region, uh, economic region in particular. Uh, to, it is a continent of one billion uh, inhabitants. The internet rates and uh, user rates have been increasing about a thousand percent. And uh, of course, it's growing very fast. And uh, the, the, the necessity for building uh, jobs, uh, to creating capacity, uh, there was a great advantage to the local economy, and the politicians are looking at this uh, seriously. Uh, but the challenge is with regulators to make this happen, the catching up to make it happen. Uh, we really need to have truly independent uh, regulators, 
regulators that relate with the users, with the telco, get feedback, uh, multi-stakeholder relationship. And the issue of power is another challenge to localizing data. Uh, so maybe solar energy is, will, be, will be helpful in this regard. And uh, also talking about uh, you know, the protecting the infrastructure. And in some economies, you have challenge of war, of uh, terrorist attacks, like uh, in Nigeria, recently talking about Boko Haram. So there's need for legislation to protect critical information infrastructure. So uh, there are a number of bottlenecks, uh, uh, but uh, the, the, key is, the idea is still very clear, and the, the truth has been made known that if it's uh, close by, it's still uh, much better. If it's moved to the region, it's okay. But for big data, it doesn't matter where it's located. Jackie, you have the opportunity to wrap up quickly. One tweet. Uh, well, I, I would just say to the question about uh, talking about the positives and the positive policy environment, uh, the main theme would be simply it's a similar positives to any kind of ICT deployment in my mind. So having the right pro-competitive, uh, good spectrum availability, all of those kinds of things that people have talked about. So. Um, and then on the uh, kinds of things that we discussed, I, I think uh, Naveen and others really talk, spoke well to the careful decision making that will be done so that some, some things, certainly local content should be localized, right? The contents that develop locally and just making the right distinctions to come out with a balanced plan that enables the developing world to uh, be on a level playing field with all of the world in accessing services that can be very beneficial for economic growth. Thank you. Well, I think overall we just scratched the surface of this quite complex and important topic. But you can lock the door and keep them all inside and go on. Just let me go out for coffee. Thank you for your patience. Thank you all for being with us. And, th and thank you also to Garland and to Vlad for putting this together. <laughs>